So I wanted to introduce our um, uh, speakers tonight. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, the great Nanfu Wang. She is a filmmaker. She introduced the film. And we also have um, who one of our uh, China researchers, uh, Yacho, Yacho Wang, Wang Yacho, um, who, is, uh, who is here with us tonight. And we will have, I'll ask them a few questions to talk through some of the critical issues of the film, and then we'll open it up for, we'll open it up for questions. Um, but I first want to say to Nanfu, Gong Chi for finishing this film uh, while also having a baby. Uh, this is your third film, correct? And uh, this film is about uh, government policy um, uh, that abused basic human rights, especially the rights of women and children. But it also is about a family, right? It's, it's really a story about your family. And uh, at Human Rights Watch, we think of, well, our film festival is a family. As you hear, we have also been around for 30 years. And uh, Nanfu is one of our family members. Some of you will remember her film, Hooligan Sparrow, which uh, opened the film festival here in New York in 2016 and also traveled around the world. So Nanfu is very well known to us uh, as a intrepid filmmaker. And from our point of view, uh, she embodies the motto of the film festival, which is courage in front of, but also behind the lens. So I'd like to begin by asking you, um, uh, you know, your previous film was critical of the Chinese government. Hooligan Sparrow looked at women's rights in China and particularly civil society leaders who were seeking justice and um, uh, faced prison terms and separation from their children. Were you concerned about going back to China, both with your son as a security, as a matter of security, and knowing that um, the policy was changing, but yet any criticism of the government um, can get you into trouble? Yeah, so um, when I started this film, I wasn't sure if I was even able to go back to China, because at the time, um, I hadn't been back since my the premiere of my first film, Hooligan Sparrow, w during which I encountered a lot of um, harassments and interrogations from the government. So I was debating, should I, could I go? Um, would I be stopped at the airport? Would I be arrested um, if they allowed me in? Or if nothing happened, would I be monitored? And the moment I show up with a camera, then the police would show up too. So a lot of those questions were on my mind. And I think the worst thing is to show up and have the film subject to be there, and suddenly the police shows up. Because even some of our subjects, if they themselves are not in surveillance, under surveillance, but what if I brought that to them? So that was when I um, reached out to a great friend of mine who became the co-director and producer in this film. She, um, sh her name is Jialin Zhang, and I met her in grad school. She graduated a few years before I did, and I asked her if she would be willing to collaborate with me, and I was grateful that she said yes. She was living in China at the time, and so she started doing underground research, and although later that she moved to the U.S. as well, and um, we did some filming in the U.S., and then I started considering going back to China, and around the time, it was very, very interesting because uh, I made another film after Hooligan Sparrow, which was um, was an American story showed the homeless problem and mental illness in America. And one day I received an invitation from the Shanghai International Film Festival, which was under the guidance and censorship of the Chinese central government. And they wanted me to show that film in China. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to go back to present that film. And it was then I realized, OK, um, it might be OK for me to go back. So. I um, decided to go with my husband and take our son, wh who was an infant at the time, and we went to my family and did the first round of a filming that was just within the family. And at the same time, we were trying to observe if the government had any reaction of surveillance. And luckily, we didn't see any signs of them intervene or um, harass or do anything. 
So that made me like encouraged me. They thought your troublemaking days were over. (laughs) Um, So so then I went back alone two months later, and then again two months later. So until the film was finished. So I know that uh, the risks I took before I had children are actually quite different than the risks I might take now. Um, did you did you have second thoughts when you were back? Uh, did you you know the state is very oppressive even in a small village like yours? Yeah, totally. The first time we went, as I said, my husband and our son and only stayed in our village, and so it was understandable why like I didn't encounter more of the harassment from the government. And the second time when I wanted to go, I had to go out of my hometown, go to different provinces to film, and sometimes to film with people that might be sensitive. So there was a huge huge discussion between me, my husband, and me, my co-director, um, talking about, is this necessary, or is this w- worth of like the risk? And having the infant totally like, didn't help that, because every decision I make now has huge consequences. And in the end, I think um, they both, and our producers too, like we all talked and actually made plans of um, emergency. Like, what if something happens? What if I was out of contact in two hours, in five hours, in tw- twelve hours, twenty-four hours? And what do we do? So there is an entire team trying to plan um, some of like emergency strategy. And then I think I was lucky to have a lot of support and and made this happen. And, and for those of you who don't remember Hooligan Sparrow or haven't had a chance to see it, please watch it on um, Netflix. I think it's available. Um, but in the last film, she's literally chased all over the country from Guangzhou to Beijing. So um, it, that was a real concern. I want to turn to uh, Yacho. I know you are the third child of your family. And uh, growing up uh, in China, can you tell us how it felt to be a so-called illegal child? What were the consequences? Um, yeah, I am the third child of my family. Um, so I had, I have an older brother. Um, he has uh, severe mental um, disabilities. So we, I have uh, an older sister. And because of the disability of my brother, my sister is legal. But my parents still want a boy. So I was born, but uh, it turned out to be a girl. My parents were disappointed, but uh, they loved me nevertheless. Uh, because I was the third child, the government uh, fined my family 2,000 and quite. That's about three, $300. It was an enormous amount of money for my family at the time. We were farmers. So my parents sold everything uh, in order to pay the fine. Um, my mom used to say that uh, you know we sold even the broom in the house. Um, uh, so everybody in the village uh, still call me Two Thousand Kwai, so that's my <laughs> name. <laughs> um, so, but I'm I, I'm very lucky that uh, because my parents paid the fine, so I was able to regist- uh, get registered. So, I was able to go to school. But uh, you know, as Nanfu's movie shows, the government really tries to instill the idea that uh, you know the extra the extra children uh, a burden to the society, are taking up resources. Uh, in the society, so you know, I when I was growing up, I just feel felt ashamed of me being the extra child of m- basically my existence. So me and my sister went to the same elementary school, but I refused to go to school with her in the morning because I did not want other kids to see that I have a, uh, a sister. So and I don't mention I didn't mention my sister during my you know, conversations with my classmates. I just omitted it, that part of my life. It was not until I came to the US, you know, I see a lot of people have siblings, most people have siblings. I start to feel it's normal to have siblings and it's okay, I don't have to feel bad of being, ha- to, to have siblings. It takes actually years to get rid of that shame because the government has really you know, instilled that shame into you, like you internalize it. Even e- after I rationally understand it's okay to exist, to not feel bad, it still takes years for me to able to you know, just tell people, you know, I have brothers, and si- I have a brother and a sister. 
So, I mean, there's there's so many aspects of the film that I, I would like to pull out for the audience. But one thing that struck me was the the sort of the the boasting about the uh, achievements of the one child policy. And this, too, is a form of propaganda and brainwashing. Um, but the one of the statistics was 150 million of uh, bragging that they had um, uh, stopped 150 million it's children more than that, more than that. Yeah. Um, so so the missing the missing uh, mostly girls often girls a, a question back to uh, Yacho again with the um, you know with the male preference in society that we that we saw in the society that we saw layered into this abusive government policy. What would happen to the um, girls? Uh, it, often families would try to have um, a male child. They would have one, two, three daughters and then have a son. What, what was life like growing up for the daughters in China? Um, you know, there are actually, I have friends who later started, uh, you know, a kind of activism in on the Chinese social media, collecting stories of girls who grew up in a family that, uh, you know, usually the girls are the big sisters, and because the parents, they, you know, they, they want boys, so they keep have children, so they, until they can have a boy. So they, when they have, they have the boy, you know, the boy is so precious, it's everything. So all the resources go to the boy, and uh, the girls are usually neglected uh, or even abused, because, you know, those are the, the girls are the children that uh, the parents never wanted. So there are those, when my f my f my friend who's actually in I think she uh, she's a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin she started this Weibo account the social media account there are so many stories of these girls who grew up in those families talking about their abuses it was a horrific like you know the because of uh, this system. This seems like a good moment to mention that um, among the tremendous research that Yacho has done, um, one of her reports is focused on discrimination against women in, in China, discrimination against feminist women who are actually demanding their rights. Do you think your experience growing up led you to this work of working with the feminist community, of advocating for women's rights? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the experience of, uh, uh, you know, growing up as a girl, um, yeah, the, the discrimination we, f uh, we felt, uh, that's definitely, you know, part of the reason. No? And a uh, question for Nanfu. What has the People's Republic of China, what has been the reaction to this film? You are already, you know, this is, uh, so friends, this is the New York premiere. It has sold out um, both nights uh, here at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival. And um, you won the, the top award at Sundance. Normally that gets you global co news coverage. How has the film gone over in China? So usually the government wouldn't directly like uh, respond to it. And for, for one Child Nation, we premiered in January, and so far what we have observed that we didn't get directly contacted, but what we have observed is when Sundance Film Festival announced the lineup, um, you know, in China they have a Chinese version of IMDB where every film gets a page, and we did have a page on it, and within a week that page was taken down, and the link is still there, and when you click on that, it would say that it was error and this page doesn't exist. And what was even funnier <laughs> to us and also impressive was when Sundance announced the awards. So, you know, at the festival, they were best narrative film, best cinematography, best editing, and best this and that. And China reported the news. And in the list, only us was missing, and we won the grand jury prize. And <laughs> they made sure that this was <laughs> that in the list. And we um, saw the news, and we uh, both, you know, thought it was really funny. So, so you're not going. You're go. not going back for a film festival in Shanghai with this film, I think. Uh, no, not this time. I have to make a film about how America sucks next to show <laughs> it in China. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you know, on a on a more serious note, I um, the what really the film reminds me of, um, and there's a reference in the film to. Um, the need to have the one-child policy because of the starvation of previous generations. 
And of course, um, uh, many people who have access to history books know that that was Mao Zedong's policies, uh, the Great Leap Forward, and its catastrophic uh, starvation that resulted, followed by the Cultural Revolution, which conservatively is estimated to have resulted in the deaths, preventable deaths of 50 million people. So it's interesting to me that the Chinese government is justifying um, a brutal and abusive policy based on their previous bad policies. Did, was that one of the themes you that came to you from the beginning or you found it out in the course of the research? No, actually, I'm so glad that you brought it out because we did like want it to adjust that in the film because uh, the starvation was not there. Um, it was a man-made starvation. And like you said, they are correcting one mistake by making another mistake. And we, we did really want it to include that part in the film, but it's such a huge history. It's, itself is a documentary so uh, we weren't able to go deep into that well i do i i want to say to the audience that the importance of this film strikes me as being like there's a, a famous book called tombstone that was an investigation of the starvation um, in chengdu and in other provinces across china and by interviewing the men and women who carried out the policy before they died, this is actually a very important historical document for your for your country, for China. Um, uh, and I you know, I hope that in other settings you'll be able to talk about this as a as a um, important work of history because the the men and women who carried these policies out may not be with us forever. Yeah, that's one thing that when we were making this film without a huge responsibility. You know, in China, um, things like Great Leap Forward, um, Tiananmen Square protest, a lot of those things are not existing in the public knowledge now. People, new generations grew up not knowing any of this. Um, the people who experienced those things either died or had to go exile outside of China or were in prison. And so the history disappeared. And then what replaced it, as I said in the film, became the propaganda the government used, how great, like how positive the Tiananmen, even, even it was just not existed. It was not something that people know. When they go search, the words were censored. And we were so afraid that like in 50 years or 100 years, the one-child policy, what would be remembered is the great policy that contributed to the economic progress. And we hope the film could stay as a record. Yeah, Cho, um, thanks to the one child policy, China now has about 30 to 40 million more men than women. And by 2030, the projections suggest that 25% of Chinese men in their late 30s will never have married. So this is also a completely, un there are gender imbalances actually in India and Pakistan and a lot of places where there is a male preference. But the male preference layered into the uh, one child policy has created a situation that we've never seen before. Um, Human Rights Watch has done uh, has a, a very recent and important report that I'm holding up here. It's uh, called Give Us a Baby and We'll Let You Go. It's about the trafficking of Kachen brides from Myanmar, Burma, to China. I've actually interviewed myself, one of the young women who was trafficked to China and uh, from Kachen and jumped out of a window to escape uh, breaking her legs. Um, uh, can you talk to us about the, the, this phenomenon and what some of the other societal consequences are? Um, I, yeah, I, you know, the, report, uh, uh, the report was done by our uh, Women's Rights Division researcher, Heather Barr. Uh, she interviewed 37 women who were uh, in Myanmar, in, the, in Kachin State, who was trafficked to China from Myanmar, uh, usually you know, the story is like this. Um, you know, in Kachin State uh, in Myanmar, there basically there's a civil war and uh, the women and their family in a very economic dire situation. So someone would approach the women the women, and say, you know, there are job opportunities in China. You, you will be paid very well. Then, you know, the woman agreed to go to China while she's on the bus. Uh, somebody gave her something to drink and she passes out. When she wakes up, uh, she will wake up in the 
uh, with her hands tied in a locked up, a locked up in a dark room. That's the house of her husband. Um, then she will be, uh, she would be, um, you know, daily, they da uh, abused and raped daily until you know she produces a child. Of course, um, you know, a lot of women would try to escape, but uh, you're in an environment totally strange to you, and you don't know a word of Chinese. And also, you know, those men are usually in villages. They are poor. They can't find a Chinese wife. That that's why they are you know trafficking wives from other countries. And then the entire village knows what's going on. Um, but so, but they would uh, like. Um, if they see a woman, the woman, the foreign woman is running away, they would capture the woman and return the woman to the husband. Um, the Chinese police uh, is, is not being used for in those situations. They really don't want care because, you know, the Chinese government know this, they, uh, there are so many more women, uh, men than women is a social problem, a societal problem, how to address them. You know, having the foreign women's not a bad bad idea. So they are. I mean, nominally, f legally speaking, they are you know against this kind of trafficking, but they're not totally not enforcing the law. Okay. I mean, this is not only happening in Myanmar; it's happening in every country neighboring China, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Pakistan. Yeah. Thank you. I think this is a good moment to go to the to the audience uh, for questions, and we have room mics. So raise your hand. We're going to try to get in as many questions as we, as we can, and we'll start down front with these two. Hello, hello. Okay, it's clear now. So first of all, I'm a citizen of People's Republic of China, to be clear. And also, I've been I've been living in the United States for seven, uh, almost eight years till now. So I mostly disagree with most contents of this film because I consider myself has been greatly benefited from the one-child policy. Um, let me see. So first, uh, the first disagre disagreement about is about the um, what I wanted to say is the attribution error about um, which you mentioned that the one-child policy has been greatly uh, contributed to the male preferences in China, but actually it is not. Because you, as ev everyone knows, that one-child policy has ended now. Now it's two-child policy, even like three children, two-children two policy or even three-children policy in like rural areas. Because in the past, there is one-child policy in the cities and two-children two policies that in the rural area. So now it's two children in the cities and uh, three children in the, in the rural area. Act, or actually, I could say it's two daughters policy in the rural area. Because if you have one daughter as, the, as your first child, then you can have the second one. Thank, but you, if thank you very much. I'm going to, um, that's a, we're going to ask people to keep the questions short so that we can have lots of time to answer. So what I'd like for um, either Yacho or Nanfu to answer is this question of the two child policy versus the one child policy. Um, I think that's a very important point you raise. But um, I would add that, of course, this means that the Chinese government is still um, controlling women's reproductive uh, systems, um, just now encouraging you to have two, but no more than two, no less than two. Um, could you respond? Um, I want to thank for your perspective. I'm sorry like, about the time that, that you didn't get to finish. Um, it's really interesting to hear your perspective, and I know that you represent a lot of people's opinion, and I've heard my friends or people online talking about it, how they felt they benefited from the policy. And as you can see in the film, too, my own mom, and a lot of people believed that the policy was great. And for you and I guess you're a similar age with me or a little bit younger. And for our generation, a lot of girls actually had mentioned that they felt that they benefit from the policy because if there were two children, then they wouldn't be able to enjoy the so-called benefit of the resources of the education that all focused on them as one, one girl, one child in the family. And um, it's interesting, I think, to think that way as uh, your own family. Um, or, and I think 
it's your family's choice if they want to have a put in all the resources in, in you. And what I don't agree with is um, when the government make that decision for the family. I think if the parents, which a lot of the families and a lot of my friends make the decision themselves to want to have only one child because of the economic burden or other reasons, but it's not for any governments decision because how many children a person can have and whether a person wants to have a child or not should not be the decision of any outside any government. It should be that person themselves. Thank you. Okay, we've got quite a few questions, so I'm going to go here um, to uh, in the back. Um, Dana? Yeah. Hi, I'm just wondering, is there any sense of shame by the Chinese government um, any retribution, other governments have uh, done things that are reprehensible. I mean, obviously, there were a lot of deaths related to this. Is there no sense of shame or something is wrong with this? So, uh, Yacho, maybe the, the question, you know, how, has there been a lot of investigative reporting? We see in the film that one, at least one journalist has had to flee for reporting. Uh, whether the, do you mean whether <coughs> there are um, government uh, response to the one child policy, like the human rights abuses related to the one child policy? I think the government's line is still that the, you know the, the the one child policy benefited the nation and it's necessary. I don't think they have you know really acknowledged uh, the tremendous human rights abuses associated with the policy. I wanted to address a little bit to um, the lady's question too. Um, yes, um, I I to completely aware of that uh, argument uh, you are presenting, and I, I agree with Nanfu. A lot of people, uh, you know, uh, have the same view, but uh, that is very much you know. Uh, especially uh, women who are from cities because they're the only child. But the city women are only a, a sm actually the mi minority women um, of the country. I'm from the rural areas where the majority and there are tremendous human rights violations. Uh, my mother had uh, you know, multiple abortions and uh, persecuted by the government for having an extra child. But where are the marginalized people? We don't, we don't have our voices. So um, you know, a lot of people who are from cities and do not aware of our situation. Okay, we've got quite a few more questions. I'm gonna take two at a time now, starting here in the middle, yes. I wanted to thank uh, Nafu for putting those ide ideas forward in this film. I was very curious as to what you think the motivation for for the people who you interviewed, specifically the government official. Like the way he spoke struck me as he was documenting what happened versus trying to advocate for a specific, different policy. So I was wondering if you could just speak to yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Actually, let's take one. We had one more here, and I'll I'll take and let's. If you wouldn't mind to just pass the mic, thanks. We want to get to as many questions as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nefu. Really like it. Um, and I think your work is very important. And thank you for your bravery of sharing um, your story of you know, rediscovery of your childhood. Um, I, my question is, um, OK, so you just said that you didn't uh, encounter much harassment from the Chinese government when you were filming, making this film, right? I'm just wondering if it is because uh, it is because you're being critical of a policy that's in the past, and with the C administration, like with um, all the policy, like new policies that, that are going on right now, um, like the extradition um, amendment law in Hong Kong, for example. Um, would you like? Do you have any plans to like address ongoing issues um, that are like? Um, causing uh, tremendous human rights violations, and if you have those plans, are you fear like do you have any fear of like going back to China to make that those documentaries? Thank you. So a couple of great questions. So um, the first, maybe take the last question first. Okay, um, mm, the first one because otherwise I would okay. forget. <laughs> I still remember that question um, about the officials and why. Uh, what was their motivation to be interviewed? Um, for example, the uh, the village official in my village, um, I went to him and I simply said, and with 
the other people too. Simply said, I wanted to hear what your witnessed, what your thoughts, and I want to learn about the history. So I wasn't like saying or arguing that I, the policy, what you see and what I see is different. I didn't do that. And in the film, I presented the way that they said it, whether it's praising the policy, which most people are. And, and I think that's what made them open to say it because none of them said anything critical except for the artist, the journalist in Hong Kong, and the Utah couple. And all three of them, they were already public. They put themselves out long time before we were making this documentary. And it didn't take long for us to find them because there were just so few people were critical about them. Uh, and then they were the people that easily we can do research and find. And with the other people, we presented it as they said, as a statement. And even when the government see it now, what they said, none of them was a secret that the government wouldn't want people to know because it's known by everyone who loved it. And it wasn't critical either. And for your question, it was actually not like uh, true that we didn't encounter any harassment. It was the first uh, trip. And then as soon as I went out to the different provinces and started filming, we did encounter things. Um, but uh, based on my experience of uh, working on Hooligan Sparrow, this time I was much more careful. Um, I didn't take public transportation. I didn't stay in the public hotel. I didn't just uh, try to stay under the radar as much as p possible and then go in and out really quick. Uh, one shoot is quick and before any anybody anything noticed. And um, whether I wanted to continue, plan to continue m making films about the current human rights abuses, I would love to in the future, um, but I know there are just so many as like what's happening in Hong Kong that you are mentioning, and I hope that more and more people would start documenting, whether it's a film, or whether it's documents, or whether it's just simply putting the information out, um, and I hope more people would do that. I can only make a film every two years or three years, or <laughs> and there are so many issues, and I do hope that I can go back to China to film, maybe not now, but in the future. Thank you. So I think our, our um, I wanted to give our speakers a, a chance to say a last few words and actually specifically to um, address a, a, um, uh, the way you close the film, where you're speaking about the, the role of government in a society and controlling women's reproductive rights. Um, uh, you certainly seem to go to a, um, a larger place be, uh, beyond China, which is already a very large country. Um, could you, um, I might ask actually uh, Ya Cho to speak first and um, to ask Nan Fu to, to sum up, but I did also bring uh, two recent Human Rights Watch reports um, that cover um, uh, catastrophic um, outcomes and human rights abuses around the restriction of um, women's right to choose. And um, uh, for Human Rights Watch, it's very clearly, it's a, it's a health matter, it's a matter, uh, you know, it's our position that governments should not be involved in any way in women's reproductive rights, that that's, that that's something for, for women to decide themselves. But I wanted to ask both of you for your perspectives as um, you both grew up in China at a, at a certain time, um, do you see these issues as being relevant beyond China? And first to Yacho. Um, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, part of the you know global discourse. Uh, I mean, it's a huge debate right now in the U.S. regarding in, uh, you know issues related to abortion. I mean, and in China, it's you know it's the uh, you know the the op kind of you know the opposite phenomenon, but the in the essence, it's the same, which is you know the women's rights to their own body. Um, yeah, thank you, Nemfu, for um, you know doing this. Especially, I really, really appreciate you showing the side of the countryside and how women um, in the countryside, you know, are, are impacted by this policy. Uh, I feel you know women in the in rural areas are the majority, and but uh, we're not represented by the media. And you know, I really appreciate that aspect of the movie. I also want to say the the figure that will stay with me from the film is the doctor who performed so many late term um, abortions, sterilizations, and 
murdered so many children. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I think it's an amazing thing that you were able to capture her story in her own voice. Yeah, um, you were talking about like going outside of China and um, agreeing to you how um, some way like opposite um, action, but it's the same thing. And it's not all happening in the U.S., but like you look at the Romania in the past and you look at the other different countries, there were just uh, so many examples of how government taking different forms to control women's body. And I think um, it's often so ignored by the society because people didn't realize that it's one of our basic human rights to be able to make those decisions, to be able to choose. And that's one of the other things that when we were making this film was to hope that you can look at China and not only just think about like that's China's problem. And it's ironic to us how a lot of countries right now even were thinking, oh, we should um, do the, we should have the India's version of one child policy. We should um, start one child policy in this or that country. And we really hope that people can look at this and, and be reflective on their own culture. And not only on the, how a policy is enacted, implemented, but also about the propaganda. Because when we live in an environment, and for us too, like how the shame of having a sibling was so internalized that it had to take us so far away and so long after to realize that it wasn't supposed to be that way. And that was how effective the propaganda was. And when you live in that culture and you were surrounded by the information going on and on all the time, you don't have the critical thinking ability to recognize the propaganda. And then we hope that people in every different culture can look around them and recognize what is, what is the propaganda that's affecting them. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to say that I hope this film is shown in China um, one day soon. Um, I do think it, I think it's important. Um, uh, and but until then, uh, you know, the Human Rights Watch Film Festival is deeply proud that you have let us help you bring this this film to the audience tonight. And we will we will work with you to bring it to the world. So thank you, Nanfu. Thank you, Yachel. Thank, thank you, you for Yachel. staying so late.